everyone! I'm back with a new making of video, which is going to be the first video in a series about making this 18th century undress ensemble. This costume was originally inspired by the blue dress in Beauty and the Beast. Seeing all the ads for the live-action film made me wonder what a historically accurate take on the animated version would look like. As it turns out, the French valued comfort and practicality in the 18th century, at least outside of the ballrooms. For going stays and ankle-bearing hems were considered acceptable, which really suited my spirited character inspiration. This ensemble stays true to the 18th century silhouette, but has a casual twist compared to my other projects. And instead of stays, the body is supported by jumps, which is the garment I'll be focusing on today. You want it fitted to the waist garment with a slightly conical shape that flares out from the waist to fit over the petticoat. It should also have straps. This garment will be quilted and lightly boned for support, but doesn't offer much reduction. It's like an 18th century sports bra. I draped a pattern for this, then transferred it to paper. But if you don't have experience draping, you could easily alter Stay's pattern or a jacket pattern from a book like Janet Arnold's Patterns of Fashion. Both of those garments have a similar shape to what we're going for. For this project, I'm using home decor material, quilt batting, cotton broadcloth for lining, and wool suiting for the binding. Step one is laying out the pattern and pinning it to the fabric. I didn't have enough material to make the sides symmetrical, but I did make sure to cut everything on the same grain line. This can be a bit painful since you do waste some material, but it makes the pieces less prone to warping, which is important in all garments, but doubly important when it's a support garment. And if you are wondering, the material I'm using is from Joann's. Then the pieces were cut out. All the pins were removed, then I used the pieces I just cut out as a guide for cutting out the lining. And now for the tedious process of marking the quilting designs onto the lining. I drew the first line based on guidelines I drew on my pattern, then transferred to the lining layer. Then I marked a line a half inch away from the one marked on the pattern, and this process was repeated until the entire panel was covered with lines that are half inch apart, and for visual interest I made the lines diagonal. Though this process doesn't seem difficult, the fabric is prone to warping and it's easy for the ruler to slip. If that happens a few times, the lines can end up really uneven, so keep an eye on that as you go. And if you're wondering why we're quilting these, it's to add structure to the material so it will do a better job of supporting the body. So after I finished marking the pieces, I got my quilt batting out. The batting was a bit thick, but it was made from two loosely woven layers, so I pried the layers apart and just used one. Then I pinned my lining to the batting and cut around it. I'm also cutting the batting from the seam allowances just to avoid extra bulk in that area. As a side note, looking back on this project, I would have sewn boning channels into the lining by machine before this step. I ended up sewing them by hand later on, and they aren't as durable or clean looking as I would like. So if you make this project, please learn from my mistake. I pinned the fashion layer fabric onto the other side of the batting with a lot of pins since I didn't want anything to shift as I was sewing. You could also use safety pins if you're worried about stabbing yourself as you sew. But the pieces were small enough that I didn't really run into that problem. Then using a blue thread and a slightly longer stitch length than I'd usually go for, I sewed across the lines marked on the lining. I'm backstitching at the end of each line, but I'm trying to keep the backstitching to a quarter inch or less so it'll be covered by the binding later on. If you aren't familiar with jumps or stays or 18th century foundation garments, the portions that extend past the waist are called tabs and don't have seam allowances. Instead of the edges being turned under, they are bound with bias tape or ribbon. Then I used the finished quilted panel to mark points on the front and back of the pattern. This isn't necessary, I just did it since I wanted the quilting to line up between the pieces. 
And in case you were wondering, this is also how I line up striped or plaid fabrics. Once the guideline on the pattern was figured out, I repeated the process of transferring it to the lining, then marking lines half an inch apart. The pieces were pinned to the quilt batting and cut out. Then the fashion fabric was pinned on top. As you can probably tell, there are a lot of repetitive steps in this process. I prepared a half dozen bobbins and got to sewing. And now it's time to baste the seams together. Once again, this is optional. I'm just doing it since I want the quilt design to line up in a zigzag pattern. So I marked the seam allowance with pencil, then used a contrasting thread and a hand needle to stitch across that point. I went through every stitch line and made sure they lined up. Remember basting stitches are to secure things before they are properly sewn. These are temporary and don't have to be pretty. Then I pinned an inch away from the point I basted to prevent the fabric from shifting when I sew it by machine. And this was repeated for all the seams. Then they were sewn and ironed open. I turned the seam allowance inward to create boning channels and pinned them down. I used whip stitches to secure these channels in place, but you could definitely do this by machine if you don't mind how the top stitching looks. I used a ruler to mark the placement of the other boning channels. There are two on each front panel to help support the bust and eyelets, and two at the back to help it curve over the skirt rather than crumpling at the waist. I pinned strips of material that had the edges turned inward to the points I marked. These will serve as the boning channels. And I sewed these down by hand, which was not a good idea. As I said earlier, I should have sewed these boning channels to the lining before doing anything else. It would have saved a lot of time and made the channels more durable. While talking about mistakes, I also should have lined the front few inches of the front panels with canvas or some heavyweight material because the fabric wasn't stiff enough to properly support the eyelets. Just something to keep in mind if you're making something similar. I know those are changes I would make if I remade this in the future, which I might do because I love the fit of these jumps, but not the construction. Now it was time to cut out the binding, which is just one and a quarter inch wide strips of this wool suiting I had on hand. I picked this fabric since it matched the floral print nicely, but it frayed a lot even when cut on the bias. So I would recommend sticking to finely woven materials that are less prone to fraying. The important thing here is to cut the fabric strips diagonally on the fabric's grain, also known as the bias, so they will have some stretch to them. All the strips were cut out, then sewn together. Then the binding was pinned on, and I used a lot of pins to secure these. I sewed the binding on with a quarter inch seam allowance, and I did this very slowly since there were lots of fiddly curves and corners. And I actually pinned and sewed a quarter of this at a time, that way if I did anything wrong, there wasn't as much to rip out, and there were fewer pins in it at once, which makes it easier to manipulate. So after finishing one section, another was pinned on, then that was sewn as well. And now I could go ahead and turn the binding inward. I start by pinning it from the front, making sure it's all in even width. Then I switch to the interior and fold the raw edge inward so it's neatly finished on both sides. This might be tricky to do since there isn't a lot of seam allowance, 
And using a fray prone fabric definitely doesn't help, but the thin width of the binding makes it easier to smooth around the curves, so it's kind of a trade off. Then the binding is sewn in place from the interior of the garment with whip stitches. I sewed most of the binding on but left the top edge open since I hadn't added the boning yet or sewn the shoulder seam. Doing these steps later made the garment easier to manipulate while I sewed the bulk of the binding in place, which was really nice since that took quite a while. It wasn't until this point that I actually added the boning. When it came to add the boning, I chose plastic, and I'm cutting it, sanding the edges, then inserting it to the channels and stitching the top of the channels shut. After that was done, I pinned and sewed the shoulder seam. And I also sewed on some seam binding to cover the raw edges. Now the rest of the binding was pinned in place. One edge was sewn on by machine and the other was whip stitched in place. The same process that I showed earlier. You would think that after all this time the binding is finished, but it isn't. I went ahead and pinned the binding around the arm openings. Sewed one side on by machine, pinned it from the front, pinned it from the back, and whip stitched it down. The final step was sewing the eyelets. I marked these on the front using a ruler and pencil, then used a grommet punch to create the holes. I stitched the eyelets by hand using three strands of blue embroidery floss, and I usually use around 40 inches of floss per an eyelet. If you've seen my other videos, then you'll know this process is pretty simple. All you do is stitch around the hole until all the raw edges are densely covered with thread. And as I mentioned earlier, I goofed up here by not making the material thick enough to support the eyelets. So even though they are sewn nicely, they warped out of shape on the first wear. So please learn from my mistake and add a heavyweight material to the front panels. After the eyelets were done, I laced the front. I originally used separate strands of ribbon for this, which you can see here, but it looked a bit bulky when worn, so I spiral laced it with a single ribbon instead. And that's it! I love the color and shape of these jumps, and they are really comfortable. If I ever had to attend an all-day event, I would prefer this to all my other historical costumes. However, as I said throughout the video, there are a few things I did wrong which make them less durable than I would like. So I'll probably make another pair with the changes mentioned earlier. I just have to find an equally pretty floral fabric first. I hope you enjoyed this video and are looking forward to the other ones focused on this ensemble. They are already filmed and should be posted in the coming months. And for more information on this project, please check out the description box. It's always packed with relevant links. Thank you so much for watching, and I shall talk to all of you very soon.